I've known Randy Giles for about 30 years, I guess. Uh, he's been at Bell Laboratories. He's most famous for developing uh, erbium dope fiber amplifiers, and there's probably 20 very fundamental papers on developing that back in the late 80s and early 90s, and uh, he and uh, uh, really put the stamp on that on that field. So, um, but uh, so he's had lots of positions. He's uh, he ran uh, Bell Labs Seoul. He's been uh, uh, chief scientist and project director and research director, and so key member for many years. But now he's chief scientist at uh, the International Space Station, and he's going to tell us about those opportunities. And maybe if you're not, I'll introduce Jonathan Volk is here, um, and uh, maybe you can tell more about Jonathan's role, because uh, but also from the space station. Right. So well, actually, right. you're mic'd. You're good. Uh, I'm all mic'd. Thanks, John. And it's, it's true that John and I have known each other for 30 years. He abandoned Bell Labs shortly after I arrived. I don't know if that's a, an exclusion principle of some sort, but uh, he's done very well. I'm pleased to see that, and I've enjoyed time at Bell Labs. But after a biblical 30 years and 30 days at Bell Labs, I retired from there on October 1st of this year, joining Casus on October 3rd, and uh, was in the office for a day and a half in Melbourne, Florida, when Hurricane Matthew came and chased me out of my office. So since then, I haven't been back. So and I, but I have been doing a variety of things in capacity as the chief scientist for cases. So it's great to be here. Uh, Jonathan Volk is my colleague with a lot more experience at case. Just ask him, not me. And I'll listen. Manager in the commercial innovation side of cases, and he is working on the vertical of the physical sciences, which is kind of explains why he's here today. You know, there's going to be a number of slides here describing some of the work that's done on station on the space, space station that's in the physical sciences. Uh, the emphasis actually is principally on the life sciences, as you'll see through this talk. But uh, I think that through the, the whole sampling of examples I give here, you'll find out how exciting the opportunities environments are. So uh, you're all asking, well, who is CASIS? You know, you've all heard of NASA, and uh, you know, they're right there. So, so they're kind of like our partners. We work under a cooperative agreement with NASA to manage some parts of the International Space Station National Lab. So CASIS is basically fulfilling a mandate of the 2010 Space Act, where a nonprofit, independent entity was created in 2011, a year after this act, to manage 50% of the International Space Station National Lab. And we say, well, 50%, what happened to the other 50%? They didn't deorbit it, it's still up there. Uh, it's actually run by NASA, and the purpose of that 50% is for space exploration and preparing for the journey to Mars. So uh, you probably are well aware that there's a number of uh, front runners for getting to Mars, like Mars One, and uh, uh, let's see, the other guy, <laughs> SpaceX. So, but uh, NASA wants to get there too, but they have a very deliberate, considered program because they want to keep astronauts healthy during that six, six month journey out there, a year on the planet, possibly at six months back. So there's a lot of studies of in the life sciences. Uh, to understand uh, the effects of the space environment on the human body to ensure that we have a safe return of the astronauts. Well, so that's uh, you know, CASIS managing the other half, which is directed towards looking at research and technology and commercialization for benefiting us here directly on Earth. So uh, the space station is unique for the space environment, as I'll describe shortly. And it's kind of like the only one of its kind. China's recently put up their own sort of uh, uh, human-occupied uh, platform, but it certainly has not yet evolved to the state that the ISS is now today. And uh, with this uh, station, there's a lot of uh, experiments that you can do in a variety of verticals, life sciences, phys physical sciences, uh, technology, and Earth observation. So. Let's look at the LEGO model of the International Space Station and look at what we're actually talking about. I can't read this even on stage, so I'm sure you can't either. But uh, what I have done is I, I circled with the red here uh, four uh, 
uh, modules which are very important to us in the uh, U.S. portion of the International Space Station. And Destiny U.S. Lab is, is a, a critical element here. Of course, there's also uh, Russia, Japan, uh, the uh, European Union, uh, probably without Britain soon, and uh, Canada has a Canada arm on it. And, and so there's a variety of, of uh, research capabilities on station, but I'm just addressing those on the U.S. side and those that are focused for benefits here on Earth, not the space exploration. Like, so for example, like uh, I won't talk today about the alpha magnetic spectrometer here, this $2 billion detector that's looking for particles that will give us some evidence of dark matter that was put on there as a US project. But that's space exploration or more fundamental than the things that I'll be talking about today. So uh, with that mandate since 2011, CASES has worked where now 71% of the research projects are from commercial companies. I mean, this is not commercialization in the sense of making factories in space yet, but it is more to help them solve uh, problems in their industries that require the space environment. Uh, since 2011, over 200 proposals have come into CASES for consideration of which 100 have been adopted. And what it means is that CASES is basically your ticket to the space station for these types of projects. We get you the, what's called the up mass, the transportation up, the down mass, you know, returning back things that has required them to be returned, and astronaut time, and of course, facilities, space on station. And I'll go into more details on that. So the, the role of CASES, again, is to get the utilization with high value research and technology projects onto the International Space Station. Uh, there, we do have a sponsored program model. We pay, NASA pays for that trip up, down, and astronaut time, which averages up to about $7.5 million per project. So that comes subsidized and through cases. So as a sponsored model program, basically you would approach your normal funding agencies and there are some specific agencies and projects which I'll talk about where we have agreements with like NIH and NSF to say you know, recruit, get, you know, and, and you know, solicit and evaluate proposals that may require the space station. And we'll work together with the funding agency, with the PIs, with NASA to get the, the projects in a form suitable for going to the space station and to get it there. Uh, also, like. What we, CASIS does is that we try to get a large geographic footprint of the interests in the space community, in the International Space Station. So uh, last week, Jonathan and I were at the Mass Challenge. This is the accelerator that's where there are uh, over 1,000 startups and small companies that vie for some recognition and awards. And at the end, there's 26 finalists. And so in the awards ceremony last week, three of the winners were actually sponsored, uh, uh, awarded from CASIS and Boeing jointly. So there's a significant amount of money that went to them for their projects to prepare them to go up to the station. So uh, that's the, the nature of how we're managing and getting projects onto the station from the CASIS direction. So what are the verticals? Who are we working with? So this is just showing uh, the life sciences physical sciences, remote sensing, and technology development. And there's a, a lot of you know, little bullet points here. It's a memory test at the end of this talk. I'm going to ask each one of you to get, tell me one of those bullet points so we can reconstruct it. But you can see protein crystallization is a very big thing. Basically what it is is that in drug discovery, often you need to have large, relatively large crystals of a protein or, or, your, or your drug or your material so that you can put it in to, uh, for X-ray or neutron diffraction and get high fidelity imagery and particularly where the hydrogens are in that molecule is very important to understand its structure. So we have a number of projects on station now that are trying to grow these proteins which are difficult or if possible, impossible to grow here on Earth. Um, I won't go through all these, but that was an important one. Accelerated disease models and aging, that's very important. Basically, if you're an astronaut in space, you, station, uh, you're going to have some problems because you're going to lose bone mass quickly. 
uh, you're going to uh, get atrophy in your muscles. Now, there are countermeasures, like for muscles, do exercises. For bone loss, uh, take the right vitamins and, and minerals and things like that. But it is a, a very hostile environment to the human body. So there's studies going on on the station to understand that, which could then have benefits here on Earth, like for osteoporosis or muscular dystrophy. So what we learn on station as countermeasures for the astronauts may then reapply to here on Earth. Jonathan, tell, I know what that says, but I could let him talk. Okay. Yeah, BASF wants to study various samples as you get solidification, you get uh, your phases. How, how do they mix? What type of microstructure forms without the presence of sedimentation? So they want to see if they can they get a more um, solid microstructure that would help enhance this uh, physical properties of cement. Thanks, Jonathan. I I couldn't have answered it, but yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, uh, technology development, you can see we've got uh, Facebook and Oculus to put virtual reality on station so you can do a virtual reality walk through the station. Uh, uh, that's pretty close to completion, isn't it, Jonathan? Uh, the project's been awarded. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're in development. Okay, all right. So, lots of project verticals, lots of interesting things. Of course, Earth observation, remote sensing is very important. You know, they have the free flyer satellites that do that today, but on station in particular, you can go into the development and test new technologies, you know, bring it up on your rocket ship, twiddle and, and, and detect and monitor, determine whether you've got the right detectors and capabilities. If you need adjustments, then you can bring it back down and possibly back up again. So I wouldn't say it's, it's an ideal iterative cycle with the uh, space station, but it's a lot better than trying to do it with satellites. Uh, we also, like I say, have sponsored programs where these companies will fund PIs to some level outside of their own organizations on projects that will go on station. And we also work with the government agencies like NIH, NSF, DOD in various sponsored programs. I'll talk about a couple of them during this talk. So I, I mentioned it briefly, but just to summarize again, what does cases do for the user support? Well, aids the researchers to identify the optimal projects can you use microgravity in a meaningful way? Does the extreme space environment help you to accelerate degradation of materials that you're trying to create and understand? Uh, is there something that in Earth observation that, that you need to do in order to prove your, your, your goals? So, and then, like I say, translation of those science goals to the space environments. Uh, Kennedy Space Center and other NASA facilities, I think there's 19 NASA centers, which have a lot of capabilities to aid in uh, your preparation for your project going to the station. And then there are, and I'll talk more about this later, third-party hardware companies that are very experienced on preparing equipment to go up to the station. They're independent of NASA, independent of us. They're just small companies for the most part. Uh, uh, all the logistics, the transportation, like I say, the up mass, the down mass, the support, while in operations, uh, video, astronaut time, and coordinating contingency, contingency plans to preserve science objectives. If something in your experiment goes wrong on station, uh, what can you recover from what you have done uh, to that point? It may be very important to understand and sort of prepare a contingency model before you launch to station. Station research, there's a lot going on. So, you know, there's there's things like in uh, combustion science, life sciences, uh, fluid sciences. There's cases right here trying to orchestrate it all. And so I'm just going to go through a number of examples of the station research. Material synthesis. Due to the lack of uh, convection, buoyancy, and sedimentation, as Jonathan was just talking about, you can get improved structure of crystals so that you can get larger crystals quite often, fewer defects in them. And in the case of the protein crystals I was speaking about before, you get larger ones for high resolution images in X-ray and neutron diffraction. Uh, there can be other cases where you need to have uh, lower defect materials, larger materials for your other sort of semiconductor work, for example. Uh, materials exposure, it's a harsh environment up there. Uh, extreme heat and cold, the ultra vacuum, of course, atomic oxygen is hitting things, the radiation damage which, of course, will damage these, uh, these uh, materials here, 
but of course they also will damage our poor astronaut and that incidentally is another part of like that journey to Mars I was talking about earlier that's kind of like the largest risk is the uh, radiation damage so materials exposure is important uh, for a number of reasons here on earth but whether it be for the shields or on the life sciences understanding its, its uh, effect on uh, living organisms it's, it's very important radiation damage is a harsh environment Well, it's a strong oxidant, and it's, it's up there in a sufficient concentration and energy to cause you know, deterioration of materials. Yeah. Ultra-thin atmosphere. Think of breathing worse than ozone. <laughs> All right. So um, some of these I won't be able to speak to directly, but if you do have questions on them, uh, Jonathan is here. The, the, basically, the, the cracking... In, of, in, during the solidification of uh, large automotive parts, uh, Nimark mark, makes large automotive parts. It's important to understand how that may uh, occur, and by solidifying melts in space, you are removing one element of the of the solidification game. The, what people typically observe are larger grain boundaries in the, in the alloys, and I think that then can give you a, a sense of a, you know, a direction towards monocrystalline, not becoming monocrystalline, but a direction towards that. So it has an inherently higher strength. The more monocrystalline like you are, the stronger you will be, and the less likely you're going to have cracks and tearing in your materials. Uh, this is kind of interesting, is that you want to have coatings in various tanks. In the example here, it's when propellants are not in contact with the wall. You can, you can conserve the material and you can look at the surface forces in greater detail than the gravity forces when you're looking at how materials contact with those coatings. We're having some discussions with some outside vendors who have equipment, very specialized equipment that needs interior coatings to reduce uh, contamination or reduce damage to the interiors of the equipment and so they're looking at new coatings that may be uh, deposited and coatings deposit in the absence of gravity have different properties again than what you'd get here on Earth. There's a lot of work in making uh, crystals of all sorts. This is now making uh, one type of uh, gamma ray and neutron detector crystal where typically you've got grain boundaries, inclusions, and cracks as shown here and trying to understand the mechanisms of these defects as they grow in the absence of gravity in particular Things like convection and buoyancy are not going to take place in your melts, and so you can expect a higher fidelity crystal growth than you might here on Earth if you have a heat process involved in the formation of those crystals. So, well, you, you know, to the point here as well, you see the bottom bullet is that uh, you could think of trying to make production in space, but you may also think of just learning of parameters to improve the production on Earth. There's also another project which has been ongoing for a while using these parabolic flights uh, to make uh, Z-Bland fibers. Uh, Z-Bland fibers are thought to be an uh, alternate choice to silica fibers in fiber optic transmission because they can have extremely low loss measured in the milli-dB per kilometer versus the uh, couple tenths of a dB kilometer loss in silica fiber. So as it turns out, in these early investigations of trying to make Z-Bland fibers in the, in the microgravity environment, uh, the, there's a, uh, the crystallites that normally form here on Earth are not forming during the parabolic flight. And it's thought that we could put on station a fiber draw capability to make Z-Bland fibers in space and then bring them back down to Earth. I don't know the full economic value of that, but that's what's under consideration right now, and there's uh, something headed for station to look into that. Indium iodide is a, another sort of uh, detector, and it's uh, supposedly better than the previous detector I just sh had shown. And so there is uh, work on station to grow these crystals, and similarly, due to the absence of buoyancy and convection, in the normal case when you have the gravity, one is looking to make larger sized, uh, more pure crystals. Additionally, you can have 
conditions where you're not contacting the walls of your furnace and reducing the contaminations that can result from that. In the uh, life sciences, there's a number of projects. Here's a fluorescence polarization in, in microgravity. And uh, basically, there's, I don't know the details of what is being measured in this, but there are many sort of aspects of the life sciences where if you don't have the mechanical cues from gravity, cells will behave differently. And in this case, when you are sort of labeling with fluorescent markers, uh, different measurements will result in the microgravity to tell you something about your, your cell environment. Uh, micro, you know, a lot of fluidics and, and microfluidics. Here is something which is looking at a personalized medicine system for drug delivery implant. So again, just trying to be in an environment where it is solely diffusion driven and not gravity driven, you can learn more about your delivery methods in these different types of implants. Uh, myostatin inhibition. Myostatin uh, prevents uh, muscle development. It's something which was uh, discovered as a gene. Uh, you know, there's a gene for it that was discovered in 1997 and may be related to some of the muscle wasting diseases here on Earth. So uh, if this little thing uh, looks kind of like a splayed out mouse, that's because it looks like a splayed out mouse. A lot of rodent models are going up to study the mice uh, in the microenvironment to look at the muscle atrophy and different ways to, to reduce that atrophy. So uh, rodent models are, are very important as are different uh, tissues and cells uh, on the space station. Uh, this is kind of interesting one, is that they're looking at uh, bioactive molecules being produced by microorganisms coming from the Chernobyl nuclear accident. It turns out these are are uh, or microorganisms that were attracted to the uh, radioactive environment of Chernobyl rather than uh, being killed by it or, or driven away from it. So they're now trying to understand what, it, what is in it in their behaviors and their, uh, their physiology that makes this uh, environmentally favorable for them. And from this, we may be able to study and understand things that relate to the radiation hazards for the astronauts when they're in space. Um, this is a, uh, a DNA amplification experiment using a mini polymerase, polymerase chain reaction device. You know, this is a very important method in, uh, in uh, DNA sequencing, gene sequencing. And this is actually was a, the first sort of molecular biology experiment done on station and was done by a high school student. Pretty remarkable result uh, activity. And yes, it is supported by uh, Cases and Boeing. Do you have any comments on this particular one? Because I, I was at the International Space Station R&D conference in July before I joined Cases and I heard the young woman speak about this project and I was just blown away thinking that, you know, if she had been in my, yeah, if she had been in my class in high school, I would have switched from science to shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, Anna Sophia. Well, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, sh I don't recall where she's from. Do you, Jonathan? Yeah, well, uh, go to the cases website, search the attribution, but just a phenomenal student. Gives you really good hope for the future. So um, some very recent work. This is Kate Rubens, who just came down a week and a half ago from the station. She was doing some work on the effects of microgravity on stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, heart cells, and fascinated. And I don't have the video to show here, but basically on her, her screen right here, you could see this culture of the uh, cardiomyocytes uh, beating in synchronicity, just like a heartbeat. And so they're just trying to understand because that's another problem for astronauts is uh, you know, in the microgravity environment that the, the, the heart muscle weakens, uh, they have a, a number of potential cardiac problems, so this type of research, maybe even using stem cell therapies, maybe not in astronauts, but here on Earth to try to help uh, those conditions here on Earth where people suffer from cardiac disease. Very interesting. Yes? Microgravity is clearly one of the characteristics of the space station. Yes. 
How micro is micro? I mean, it's close to zero. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I think that it's, it's not micro for a couple of reasons. And I mean, sorry, not zero for a couple of reasons. Micro is around, I believe, 10 to the minus 5 in the uh, most pristine environments on the station. But there is vibration. There are astronauts walking around. There's equipment. Uh, there's, there's also a very slow deorbiting due to air drag of the space station, so it has to be boosted up from time to time. But can you tell me, Jonathan, what the full range is? Because I knew that they have basic vibration isolation capabilities as well to improve upon that. Yeah, there's a few theories. I think it's between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 6. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So actually, of course, at that altitude, if you weren't doing sort of that orbit, if you're just trying to measure the Earth's gravity, it's, it's still about 90% of the gravity that is what we feel here on Earth. But you know, people say you're free falling or you know, you've got the centripetal force balanced with the gravitational force. So microgravity is from the Einstein perspective. All right. Hard to wet surfaces. Um, you know, you, you swallow that pill, it doesn't dissolve, and you find that you, you're eliminating before the excipient has done its duty in your body. Well, um, there's studies to understand these types of surfaces, what are called these hard to wet surfaces. Not exactly hydrophobic, but nonetheless, you want to get the water permeating into them. So here again, you want to have just the effects of di diffusion and chemical reaction and to study them uh, here on the space station. Um, just more uh, molecular biology studies so that the samples uh, that from, uh, yeah, I, I think I'll be talking more about this later on, but anyways, uh, you can grow a variety of tissues and you can look at the DNA and RNA attributes and their, for the gene expression. So access and opportunities, because I'm sure everybody here in this room wants to get a project on station, if you don't want to go to station yourself. You know, when I joined cases, I asked if I get a site visit. They said probably not likely. <laughs> so um, there are the sponsored program focus areas. Recently with the NIH, the uh, Biomed Research uh, cases, uh, the impact of microgravity on fundamental stem cells, the uh, National Lab, that's 2016 initiative. So WU, Stanford, uh, that's the beating heart example. And I'm not really sure of what the other two that are listed here are that are, that are to launch soon. Uh, organs on a chip, that's a really big deal. Basically, you know, you've heard of uh, you know, um, lab on a chip. You've heard of tissue on a chip. You've heard of organ on a chip. You've heard of human on a chip. You've heard of astronaut on a chip. So basically, these are trying to create small uh, chip environments to do as much as you can to understand the the uh, effects of the space environment on these physiological systems. So, you know, it turns out that even sending mice up there is very challenging. And it's only recently that had there even been a consideration, the Japanese, of sending mice back down alive. Typically, they get dissected and frozen, sent back to Earth that way. So, uh, it's, it's challenging to get the larger models up there. There are nematodes and there are plants and there are other things, but these, this uh, you know, tissue on a chip, Organ chip is human tissue, you know, and mimicking human organs. This is not making you know, full-size human organs, but there's ways in microfluidics and, and micro devices to make things that behave like a heart, like a liver, like a lung, and you can study them uh, on these systems on the station. Um, then I, we have uh, one researcher here who has the benefit of the NSF-sponsored research in fluid physics. There's also in combustion. And then, as I just had mentioned, this Chips in Space uh, was just recently announced in September. So um, there is uh, NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is looking at these microphysiological systems, MPSs, organs on the chip collaboration. Uh, actually, I think it's right now, this week, to tomorrow, day after tomorrow. There is a workshop at Ames, you know, just down the road, well, not the road, from here, 
which is a workshop on vascularized tissue. You know, a big problem of, of trying to make uh, uh, replacement organs here on Earth, if you're going to sort of you know, grow them in a lab, bioprint them, you know, make a scaffold and, and, and create them here, is the, is the uh, putting in the, the nerve cells, the innervation, and uh, putting in the, the vascular uh, uh, system as well. Uh, there's a number of reasons where these, uh, because it's a very soft tissue at some point, it, it's, it's more likely to collapse. It's hard to get those vessels in place. Of course, you're not going to get that type of collapse on station. So there's lots of interest in studying a vascularized tissue uh, on the space station. Because just, you know, a, a, a lump of muscle uh, tissue is not going to be useful to you as an implant if it doesn't have blood vessels, if it doesn't have nerve cells. It's more, not more differentiated. And that's still hard to do. So there's a lot of research going in that area. Here's this uh, uh, one of the uh, platforms being developed for the ISS. And this is uh, you know, looking at the degradation and uh, repair of composite skeletal tissues in microgravity. And as I mentioned before, like bone loss, muscle loss, these are big issues. And this is focused on the bone loss and the countermeasures to it. Uh, there was. Five awards for the fluid dynamics. One of the awardees is here, but you can see that uh, I won't go through uh, the explanation of the details on this, but uh, there's a, a lot of interesting things in uh, fluid studies that can be done in the absence of gravity. Like if you think like bubbles, air bubbles float to the surface of water here on Earth, that's not going to happen in space in the microgravity environment. So you get very different behaviors as a result of that. Um, and then if you look at the middle one, it says UC Santa Barbara, Paolo. That's, that's going to be your project. Um, can you explain it just briefly? Sure. Um, so the idea is that um, when you look at dynamics of sediment uh, here on Earth, and you try to study how uh, sediment particles uh, come together, you see that uh, they uh, undergo a process called flocculation, whereby these particles will join and there's some very weak but very important electrostatic forces. If you try to study in the lab, uh, this behavior is uh, partly obscured by the fact that you also have settling due to gravity. Uh, by doing this experiment in microgravity, we can turn off. Uh, the settling and just study the fluctuation uh, on its own. Right. Yeah, so flocculation is pretty important for clays, for example, aren't they? For, for making them sort of very impervious and to uh, water, for example. Uh, so the densification. Yes. Yeah. So this is also very important for things like models of erosion. Yes. Okay. For erosion. So uh, marine snow and so on. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything further. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. I want it from the expert. All right. So uh, on this uh, last portion of the talk, I'll talk about commercial services and implementation partners, because most of you here will not be familiar with how to get a project on station, what it needs to qualify. It has to be safe. It has to be non-toxic. It can't explode. It's got to you know, fit the uh, size, weight, and power requirements for the station. And it just has to make sense in general. It has to be realizable in a form which is suitable for the space station, for the safety of the astronauts and the, and the station itself. So uh, basically, with the commercial services, on-station equipment can be designed and built by a commercial company. And it's predominantly commercially funded. Uh, we have a services agreement with NASA for the deployment and installation of that equipment. CASIS does not run the, the launch program. NASA, SpaceX, Orbital ATK, they're the people who do that. But we are there to help integrate you into those uh, launch procedures. Um, so the ops, you know, when it gets on station, it's going to require, it may be completely passive. It just needs, you know, a, a spot on the wall and no other sort of connection. But it may need electricity, it may need water, it may need astronaut time, it may need a switch being turned on and off periodically. These are the types of things which we will sort of plan and work with you. It may not sound like much, but cases 
gets two hours of astronaut time per day for doing the experiments that, that uh, we are supporting, putting on station. And as it turns out, astronauts are very busy. That's a very valuable amount of time provided for doing the experiments. So if you're going to make an experiment and pro propose one, don't ask for three hours a day because you're not going to get it from us <laughs> unless we put more on station. That's another discussion. Um, okay. So actually, this, these commercial services have only recently been growing. Basically, the U.S. government, Congress, NASA as well, wants low Earth orbit to be a commercial environment. NASA wants to get out of the low Earth orbit game and leave it to the commercial enterprises like, say, SpaceX or like Blue Origin, and with our help bringing other companies up there. So uh, the, it's now to the point where there's sufficient interest and capability. You can see from this chart here, there's a number of companies that have recently been formed and more to come who will be your partners for making the equipment to get onto the space station or other platforms that, that uh, may be coming in the future. So with NanoRacks, for example, it's a satellite deployment. If you need to get a CubeSat out there, uh, there's a number of capabilities, and we will help you to get your CubeSat, your satellite up to there. And there's uh, very small satellites, which are basically like ham radio, amateur radio enterprises, student projects, and so forth, to ones which get more serious that can have in the shown here the cases of 50 to 70 kilogram weight being deployed, but often those are government agencies using those services, but provided in large part by a private concern. Uh, there is this, uh, NanoRacks has the external payload platform, so it's useful for the uh, attaching something to be exposed to the extreme environment or for Earth and deep space observation, sensor development, and like I say, testing advanced electronics and materials. You know, it's not so easy to get from inside the station to the outside. That's mostly like an astronaut's task, uh, an EVA, extravehicular activity. And so uh, getting something on this, you can actually see in this case it has a little grappler, so a robotic arm can help to sort of move this around, in and out. And so it actually is a, a very important capability to be able to move away from the EVAs with the astronauts, very complex, challenging procedure, to something which can be done robotically and NanoRacks is, is there to help. So you can expose your systems to space or develop something that is a sensor or observation platform. Space Tango is another company that helps, and you can see here mostly in the medical area, but I think they'll do the physical sciences too, won't they, Jonathan? They'll do anything for a buck, right? So in any event, uh, basically in a, in a multi-U platform, very standardized shape and, and uh, connectivity, you can basically build your experiment, your lab in a box that can then be sent up to station. And they know all the protocols and capabilities and things that you have to do to, to make it work and be safe. Uh, another example, uh, Scorpio 5, B new, pardon me, uh, Biochip Space Lab, basically an automated uh, live cell research and imaging platform in space, trying to move away from astronaut time being needed to run your experiments, uh, the biotype experiments. Tech Shot, uh, they're, they're developing a number of capabilities also in the uh, life sciences area, uh, cell culturing, uh, C. elegans is a nematode, so they're helping sort of make a, a living sort of platform for that. Protein crystal growth I mentioned before, they do a variety of things. Uh, bone densitometers, uh, they, they have a little device that can measure the bone density of the mice, which is very important again in the bone studies that are being done, they're looking at other animals too. Um, Furnace capabilities, more for the material sides. This is an eye chart, blame Jonathan. Uh, right, Jonathan? This got this from you. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so essentially, you know, crystal growth, uh, materials development, annealing of things, 
Um, there's a, quite a few capabilities. There's, uh, there's a link at the end of this talk that will give you a link to where you'll find about all the resources and infrastructure that are on, space, on station and accessible for your research. But there are a lot of sort of materials research studies. Uh, I've been talking just about the US capabilities, but here in the uh, Japanese Kibo facility is a very exciting capability, the electrostatic levitation furnace. Basically, you, you can have a little bead up to about five millimeters in diameter that will be uh, laser heated and levitated electrostatically, or at least maintain a position, because here on Earth, uh, uh, you might need the levitation. But up there, with the microgravity, it's just very minute forces that you need to keep it centered with the impinging lasers that are heating your samples up to greater than uh, 2,000 degrees. So uh, really a, a very fine resource. And then um, this is a platform developed by Teledyne, which uh, you can bolt on. Yes. On that last slide. The previous slide? You'd, you'd think so, yes. I think that this whole system uses 550 watts of power. A substantial fraction of that is going to the laser. Let's say it's going into half. Let's say putting a couple hundred watts from the lasers. That's, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they look like the atom cooling experiments. That's right, yeah, it balances. Yeah. You're thinking of that for wafer sat? <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, this last one, again, is this uh, multi-user platform. You know, bolt your telescope, bolt your sensor onto this. It can be pointed. It has uh, data capabilities. It has a number of robotically installed instruments, basically uh, uh, pan-tilt platforms for doing precise pointing as may be required in your, your experiments. So that's another thing where if you need something on the outside as a sensor, you can put it there. So very quickly, in summary, uh, the ISS National Lab is highly utilized in, in a wide range of life and physical sciences research. In a 10-year period from, from 2000 to 2011, there was over 1,000 experiments that were done. Um, cases uh, since 2011 has been managing 50% of the ISS NL for research, having benefits for Earth. And as I have lastly summarized, to help you get your project in the right condition for launch and installation on, on the station. There are commercial services provided from implementation partners. And if you want to learn a lot more, you can go to spacestationresearch.com. It's very informative. And from that, there are other hyperlinks that will take you to a really whole vast array of science, technology, experiments that have been done and will be done on the space station. Thank you. Additional questions? Yeah, it's an off-topic question, but you, you talk a lot about bone density. When you read science fiction, people are always spinning and using some typical words to ah, yes. bone logs. Why don't you see that in, in space? Well, uh, they do a lot of exercise. They have. Uh, nominally two and a half hours of exercise per day, although we're learning that the astronauts are cheating and doing less than that. But uh, that's to sort of mitigate. But so basically what's happening is what's called bone remodeling. You've got your osteoblast and osteoclast. The blasts deposit, the clasts take away. And in the microgravity environment, they really don't know what they're doing. And it turns out the clasts win, and you start to lose bo bone as a result of this uh, remodeling that is taking place all the time in, in your body. You know, your, even your bone is not really a static uh, structure. Pardon me? Uh, well, I guess it's, it, it, it's you could, <laughs> but it'd be kind of uncomfortable in a small centrifuge because you have a significant gradient on your gravity. You know, at the center of it, you'll be zero G, and, and somewhere else, you'll be uh, you know, having your, your one G environment. So you, you know, living in that gradient still may be a problem unless you make a very large structure. And larger structures are more expensive. I think is sort of the bottom line on that. Uh, uh, is there any other sort of point you can make? The, the gravity gradient and expense of large structures, I think, is the main issue. Yeah, he doesn't know. <laughs> OK. Yes, Dad. Correct. What's going to be the model? Is it going to be the same as airspace? Whatever we go over a continent, low Earth is governed by that country? Ah. 
Ah, I see. So, so what Dan is asking is about uh, uh, space rights. Uh, and honestly, I don't know where that lands, but I suspect if there is a significant military confrontation, the U.S. will not be flying satellites over China. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the FAA regulations will read on that for the U.S., but obviously it's not just the U.S., and, and again, I don't really know, know what the answer. I, I, well, there may be, and I can't, but I'm just saying I can't really address that. Now, Jonathan, do you know about new space policy? And is, that may... Yeah, but that's, that's yeah, U.S. alone, so I don't know how they negotiate. Yeah. You're just going to have to fly over ocean. <laughs> 10 miles, 100 miles out. Yes? Just a follow up question on that. But so when you have tea or coffee or anything eat, it flows down. Yes. And how does it work? Because you cannot know. force it down. Peristaltic motion, I guess, right? You know, we, 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 we are designed to sort of force food and liquids down into our body. and. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we came from space originally, but obviously this this our, this one G species that we are has has the capability of taking in food in the in the microgravity. But I don't know what it feels like, and I haven't asked uh, my boss, who's a former astronaut, what it felt like to try to ingest food. But it's a good question. But you should be asking an astronaut. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, have you seen like the, the guy from uh, uh, the State University in Portland, uh, Mark uh, Wise Lojo, who designed a very interesting coffee cup that relies upon surface tension to be able to retain the fluids so that you can drink more naturally, not just have it going out of big lumps floating around in the station. It's quite fascinating. So. If you just, I, I imagine you can uh, Google or look on YouTube, sort of like coffee cup on, on the, the International Space Station. And it's a very exotic uh, fluid uh, dynamic model of a very unique uh, cup. It doesn't look like that thing you're holding. What is the time frame? Uh, getting something, you know, it's almost like the gestation period for a human has a minimum, maybe nine months or longer. Quick. It would be quick. Yeah. So what would you say? I mean, that's sort of a quick one. Yeah, I would say, in general, we tell and follow from the test system. We put on our NSF solicitation. We say, once you're awarded, you're ready to fly within 18 months. So typically between 12 and 24. It's based on how quick the PI wants to work. Um, you know, if they're ready, because a lot of it requires them to do the ground study, to do all the you know, work with us to help develop the, the project. Uh, so it's really... 12 to 18, maybe 18 is probably the average, but maybe it's really up to the PI how fast they want to work. Um, and getting on a launch change, obviously, that's a whole an extra layer, but for the most part, I think 18 months is probably a fair, a safe guess. And, and experience as well. If, you're, if you are flying a game, uh, you'll get up there without having to go through like, these implementation partners as you would do in the first time. So, uh, who wants to put something on on the space station, John? <laughs> and uh, well, you're, you're already you don't count. <laughs> you're already there. So uh, you mentioned radiation uh, damage. Yes. That's right. So how how are they doing? What are the solutions? Ah, what are the solutions? There is one drug which one of our board members has developed which actually is there to help mitigate radiation damage. Basically you try to accelerate your own natural repair mechanisms. We're always having things break. I think the number is like 60,000 repairs in each cell every day. So obviously if you get something more devastating from say a high, high Z uh, impact, you know, high, you know, heavy, heavy ion impact to your body, uh, you know, it could be pretty severe and difficult to repair, but basically if you try to accelerate your own repair mechanisms. And there is a, a genetic variability in terms of the astronaut's susceptibility to chrosomal damage 
from the radiation exposure. So with some sort of uh, drug countermeasures, and maybe you're just you know, selecting astronauts that have sort of that best sort of radiation resistance, if they can determine it, those may be the best ones to sort of choose for your long duration flights. No, it has not. It could be. I mean, we're talking about, for the NASA anyways, like in the 2030s, so I suspect that the medical advancements and understandings will be quite significant in the intervening 15 years or so for that to occur. Uh, the other thing which they think of, like when you land on Mars and you're spending a lot of time there, look for a cave or, or you know, be next to a cliff to sort of minimize the exposure. You don't want the, to be you know, exposed and there's a big solar flare. That's a big unknown. That can give a lot of, uh, you know, there's, I guess, the 1973 and the 1989 solar flare events, which they figure that if you're up there at that time, it would have been pretty unhealthy. So, yeah, hide <laughs> behind Mars. Yeah. Or instruct, you know, use, an, use what's out there. Hide behind an asteroid. I don't know. Thank you.